Sorry about that. Good afternoon. The death penalty. We save this penalty for the most horrendous and egregious of crimes. In this particular case, you've reached the special, special circumstance of multiple murders. And to be eligible for, this, for the death penalty under the multiple murder, you must decide that the defendant committed one first degree and one murder of at least the second degree. In this case, we have three first degree murders, none second. That means all three of these murders were willful. They were deliberate. They were premeditated. Above and beyond the requirements of the special circumstance. You also have to consider the circumstances of the crime as it relates to the victims. What role, if any, did they play in their deaths? Were these victims drug dealers? Were they gang members? Was it some issue from, uh, regarding a rival gang? Was there a history of physical or sexual abuse that created some sort of provocation on the part of the defendant? Or were they vulnerable? Was a weapon involved? Was this, were these murders particularly graphic? And you know the answers to these questions. So let's talk about Ricky Anderson and his vulnerability. He had his back turned, he had a beer in his hand, not knowing that Brandon Mark Martin was behind him with a baseball bat. And as Brandon gripped that baseball bat and swung it, without warning, struck Barry in the back of the head. I'm sorry, uh, struck Rick in the back of the head, causing him to fall down then striking him in the throat, fracturing his hyoid, and then blow after blow after blow while Rick is on the ground. Didn't know what was coming. Had no way to defend himself. And Brandon turned him into this. turned him into this. He was a fighter. It took him a while to die. Let's talk about the vulnerability of Barry Swanson. He was unarmed. And he could have survived. Barry could have been here to testify to all of you. Because if you remember, he was over by the ADT panel. And as soon as he saw the violence towards Ricky, he could have ran away, ran out the garage, down the hallway and out through the garage, and lived another day. Lived another day to see his children. Another day to be the glue in the relationship. But he died as he lived. If you remember, he was a Vietnam veteran. He survived five helicopter crashes. If you remember that testimony, he was shot down five times. One of those times, he jumped out 20 feet above the, above the ground. He lived through all that in Vietnam. He was a person that ran towards the danger, not away from it. He, lived, he died the way that he lived, trying to help somebody else. But he could not survive Brandon Martin. Brandon Martin turned him into this. And the wall there, 
It's painted with Barry's fingers, painted with his blood, trying to move. The vulnerability of Michael Martin doesn't get any more vulnerable. Wheelchair bound. Person on dialysis who had diabetes. He was lifting one pound weights, something a child could easily lift. And this is what I want you to think about as Rick is being bludgeoned, as Barry is being struck over and over again. Michael's sitting in his chair, listening to the skulls crushing, the baseball bat coming down time and time again while he's sitting defenseless, not able to lift a hand to help. His brother-in-law, Ricky, getting killed in front of him. A man trying to keep Brandon out of the house, getting killed in front of him. The sounds of that violence. Think about that. He watches, listens, and waits. Think about the moments before Michael died what he was thinking, what he was potentially doing during that time. I can't imagine, maybe I just don't want to, that he sat there silently while all this was going down. Common sense tells you that he was pleading for the violence to stop. For Brandon to, to stop what he was doing and just to to give mercy. And then comes Michael's turn. I don't know if Michael pled for his life during those moments before Brandon took that baseball bat and swung it to his head. But I do know that Michael's spatter was all across the wall because of the force of the blows, the multiple blows, to Michael's head. And to put insult upon injury, or in, in this case, insult upon death, he sends a message to his mother, Melody, for when it's her time to come home, Here's your husband. Here's my dad. When she opens up that garage, what would she find? Unfortunately, well, luckily for Melody, and unfortunately for Michael Anderson, he came home first. He was the one that saw the death first, and not even knowing that the person that he saw was his father. So let's talk about the impact to the Andersons. Rick was close to many, as you've heard. Uh, Robin Lancaster said that Rick was the best thing to ever happen to her. And what's interesting about that is she remarried, but yet it's such a rarity, but she kept close ties with Rick and the family, and she would attend birthday parties. And it was difficult for her to even admit with her husband listening, but she said, you know what? I, he was the best thing. I was a foster child, and he, he took me in, and, and we fell in love, and it was the best thing to happen to her at that time. And this is a man that left that stamp with her, that footprint with her. Michael Anderson's best friend. And I'm sure many of you probably thought, how, can, how many people can actually say that their father is their best friend? And I hope that's a lot. But in this case, it was certainly true. And how many people talk to their father 
every week or every month. Michael talked to his dad every day just about. And not just that, but multiple times a day. So think about all the missed conversations that he's had over the last five years. And Craig, he misses his brother. They had a big family, and, and one of them dies in this way. This is the man that Rick was. Now let's talk about the impact of the Swansons. Well, we already know that Barry was the glue that held these kids together. It was a devastating impact to them. And what's, what's sad is, among everything else in this case, right, is that Jeremy and Josh haven't spoken to each other in two years, and it takes this trial for that to happen. And Barry was very well liked in the, in the community. He organized those bike rides on the motorcycles. Hundreds of people would show up. This was Barry, and this was Barry's family. Now let's talk about the impact of Michael Martin. Michael and Craig were very close. Craig called him a brother. You know what? Michael, even though he was severely disabled at the end of his time, he had the right to die on his terms and God's terms. But Brandon took that away from him. And don't get me wrong, there is an impact on the entire family. There is an impact on Melody. There is an impact on Sean. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And, I, and yes, I cross-examined her, and there are some things I have issue with, mostly her credibility and Sean's credibility. But they did not deserve this. Absolutely not. I can't imagine losing a husband and losing a child. I can't imagine losing a, a father. They didn't deserve this. And I can understand what they're trying to do. I can understand their presentation of testimony to all of you. I can do that, and I can't blame them for that. But it doesn't make them credible either. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Rick and Michael were friends. I mean, look at that. That's two <laughs> grown men on a roller coaster. the impact of Michael Martin, this is the man that he was. Now let's talk about the impact of Brandon Martin. Well, we know that he cut off his friends. He unfriended everybody on social media. Not one friend or family member has visited or talked to him in over five years. Now, we've had multiple people up here saying it, the impact that Brandon's had on my life was, was great. And the impact of losing him would also be great. But it would, it would have been really nice to know if somebody has actually talked to him in the last five years, if somebody has actually visited him in the last five years, or even tried to, for that matter. In Mr. Wellborn's opening statement, he stated, we don't execute the mentally ill. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Remember Factor D, and I, I brought this up with Dr. Abrams, who apparently has testified in over 100 capital cases uh, with regard to mitigation with uh, as it relates to mental illness. But he didn't even know what Factor D was. It was just read to you. Factor D is whether the defendant was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance when he committed the crimes. Okay? And what's important about that is I asked Dr. Abrams about the crimes in this case. And remember what he said? He didn't review any of the guilt evidence. Didn't review any of the guilt evidence. 
He said it wasn't important. It wasn't relevant. Well, this says, the law says, it is. Because you have to know whether the defendant was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance when he committed the crimes. Now, don't be mistaken. This is not a not guilty by reason of insanity phase. This is not a not guilty by reason of insanity case. You have already made the determination that Brandon Martin is guilty. The sole determination for you right now is how much mitigation, how much weight goes to this mitigation of his mental illness. That's your only determination. So let's talk about that. First, was he under the influence of an extreme mental or emotional disturbance when he committed the crimes? So the evidence presented. Well, how many times has he heard voices? I know Melody said that he heard him every day. And I submit to you that's not credible testimony. Because when, what did she tell uh, the officers in this case? Well, we all hear voices, right? We all talk to ourselves. It's no big deal. She mentioned one outburst to law enforcement. And there's no evidence that he had any sort of outburst uh, or any sort of voices, command voices on the day of the murder. There were no voices telling him that he had to go home and kill his family. He understood that it was wrong to steal, to evade the police, to lie about the murders. And consider his statement that he gave Detective Godfrey. The fact that he said, prove it. Prove that I did this. He didn't say, well, you know what? Voices were telling me to kill my dad. Voices were telling me to kill my uncle. Voices were telling me to kill the security guy at the house that was trying to keep me out. He didn't say that. He did know that was wrong to steal the car because he said so. He knew it was wrong to evade the police because he said so. So he knew right from wrong. Not that that's really for you to determine if you knew right from wrong, but it is, it is evidence highlighting his mental state at the time. We know that he was a, tr a chronic drug abuser, although that was definitely downplayed by his family. But we know about the parties at the mansion, about the cocaine, the LSD, the marijuana. Dr. Solomon was the last person, last psychologist to see him before the murders. There's no information to him about these hallucinations or delusions or talking to himself or command voices telling him to hurt somebody. That would have been absolutely important information. And Melody spent time with him talking to him about Brandon. But none of this information came up. And why is that? Because it wasn't that as big of a deal as they're trying to make it out now five years later. And I get that. I get why they're doing that. I can understand that. And I don't blame them for it, but it doesn't make them credible. He was acting normally at ETS. He was, there's no evidence that he was talking to himself on the bus ride. There is a video, if you remember that, of him on the bus ride. He's not talking to himself. He's not making outbursts. He's not bothering other people. He's not doing anything weird. During the interview, he's not telling Detective Godfrey, I can't hear you because there's other voices talking to me. There's no evidence. He, he is being responsive to her. And he's committing goal-oriented behavior. He, wants, he needs to go home so he knows where to get the bus. He knows how to get on the bus. He knows where to go, which bus stop to get off. He knows how to walk home, where to walk. He knows 
where his house is. <clears throat> and after the killings, he knows that he has to leave because he did something bad. And after the killings, he's hiding out. And then when he knows that he's ran out of gas and he needs to switch cars or trucks, he knows that he's got somebody's cell phones that he has to dump because he knows that the police could track him, which is all true. He knows that when the police lights are, uh, are on behind him that he needs to pull over, which he does. He knows that when he's commanded to put his hands out the window, he does that. But then he knows that he's going to, be, he's going to jail, according to his own statement, for potentially the rest of his life. He doesn't want to go to jail. He doesn't like the police, so he leaves. It's all goal-oriented behavior. He knows how to use a weapon. He knows to take a wallet from a dead person and try to use their credit card to get gas. There's no evidence of any delusions or hallucinations after the arrest. So what would you expect to see if he was under extreme mental, and mental disturbance at the time of the murders? Bothering people on the bus, able, unable to control his emotions, command hallucinations, delusions. Now, I also want to talk about what Mr. Wellborn said in his opening, that there was no motive for the murders. Well, we know that that Brandon was a polysubstance abuser. We know that every kid's dream job, right, is to play professional baseball. And he screwed that up. He was fired by the Rays. We know that he was hanging out with the wrong crowd. And that wrong crowd was making him ashamed of being black, and then he started resenting his dad. And it, according to Sean, uh, that was something that Brandon grappled with his whole life. And he punched Michael, called him the N-word. Then we know that there's an argument that uh, leads to choking uh, Melody. An argument with Melody and Sean with the scissors incident, if you recall that. So now he's upset at them. And then, of course, on 9-15-2017, there's an, what we, it's not an intervention. It was a bunch of family members to come over to, quote, beat his ass, end quote. If Mr. Martin, if Brandon Martin was so debilitated by a mental illness, why would Melody be okay with family members to come harm him? Why would Sean want to beat his ass? If Brandon Martin was in such dire need of medical or mental help, why is Craig and Michael Anderson and Rick Anderson compliant to go over there and beat him up? Because they knew what he really needed which was substance abuse treatment. So going on, on 9-15, uh, the family calls the police to have Brandon detained. So everything now is, is happening from 9-13 to 9-15, and it's all about Brandon. The families, and I get it, I can understand their concern for him, and I can understand their frustration for him. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. He's acting out against them. So what does, what does the family do? They, they have him detained. And I can't imagine the frustration that was going through Brandon's mind at that time. Then he comes home to change locks and a security man at, at his house to keep him out. And then lastly, the ultimatum by Rick. Leave the house and family alone or go to drug rehab. The camel that broke the camel, the straw that broke the camel's back. 
But you have to remember, these are the choices that Brandon made. He chose to sign an $860,000 contract to rent a mansion, to do drugs, to party incessantly, to refuse to listen to family. Emily recognized his bad choices. Matt Dudgel did too, but he chose to cut them off. He acted out against his family. He chose his path. There, and as what Dr. Solomon testified this morning, there are thousands of people with mental illness who abide by the law, hold jobs, pay rent, bills, have relationships, function in society, show up to appointments, take medication, who don't kill. In fact, what he said is it's very rare that somebody uh, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia commit murder, that kill people. He said it was a myth that schizophrenics Schizophrenics are violent. And Dr. Solomon was a doctor, a psychologist that actually saw Brandon Martin, actually looked at him, evaluated him, and tried to treat him, talked to Melody. He was the last psychologist to see him before these murders. What's interesting about Dr. Abrams, who uh, apparently testified unethically because he made a diagnosis of Brandon without ever seeing him, without ever actually meeting him to treat him. And Dr. Abrams said, well, you know, there are dozens of uh, cl uh, clinicians that have diagnosed him with uh, schizophrenia. Okay, well, he was paid upwards of $20,000 if you did the math. $20,000 to come testify when somebody that actually saw him could have come in and testified potentially for free. So I, I don't know why it was Dr. Abrams, and again, according to Dr. Solomon, comes in and testifies unethically because he never treated, never saw Brandon Martin. If there were all these other people that diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, wouldn't you want to know? Wouldn't you want to have them testify? but Brandon Martin chose to kill. Now, was the defendant perfectly fine? Don't mistake me on this. He had substance abuse issues, again, his choices. He had a mood disorder that, that was brought up. And yes, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. I'm not hiding that fact. But again, was this so debilitating as the family would like you to believe that he couldn't function in society, but all the evidence at that time, all their statements near that time, all say, you know what? Yeah, he had a couple of outbursts. Yeah, he talked to himself a couple of times, but he was able to function just fine. He was able to live in a hotel just fine when we kicked him out. There's no auditory hallucinations prevalent prevalence, meaning that all the time. And Melody never shared that information because, again, it wasn't that big of a deal until now. And like I said, I get it. I understand why she's doing it now. Even Sean didn't mention anything about paranoid schizophrenia when he uh, test testified because he didn't know about it. You would think that if this paranoid schizophrenia and all the symptoms surrounding it were so bad at that time and so severe that Melody and Sean and Michael Martin would have gotten all the family in on it and told them, hey, listen, this is really bad. We need to help him. Not beat him up, but help him. Get him some treatment. Not drug rehab, but mental health treatment. Not give them an ultimatum of, we're going to kick you out onto the street unless if you enter drug rehab. But now, the friends and the family, understandably, want to rationalize this. They want to rationalize these, these terrible murders by saying, well, 
you know what? He was really bad back then. He was talking to himself every day. His eyes weren't the same. I, I felt a presence of evil when I walked into his room. Does that, does that sound contrived to you? Do their testimonies, did that feel contrived to you when they testified? And Mr. Wellborn's going to come up here and he's going to ask you essentially to give mercy to someone with a mental illness, which is pretty powerful, which is something very powerful to say. But I want you to remember this, that mercy does not fall from the sky and rain upon the undeserving. It requires remorse and accountability. It requires the defendant's ownership and accountability to their actions not to steal the property of the people that they, they killed, not to evade the police, not to fight with the police, not to blame these terrible crimes on someone else. Not a shred of remorse. And I urge you to listen to his statement again and ask yourself, is, is this somebody worthy of mercy? Is this somebody that has any remorse for the loss of his father and his uncle and somebody else in his room, in his house. The callous attitude he's had towards his victims. The callousness towards these deaths, frankly, is it's unforgivable. Give the full extent of justice and have the moral strength to return a verdict of death. Thank you.